Welcome to the Business of Platforms, a video podcast series where Vivaldi will be chatting with the world's leading marketers, thinkers, and innovators about the evolution of business and the exciting ways in which platforms are helping companies and brands deliver greater value. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Eric Joachimsthaler. I'm the founder and CEO of Vivaldi Group. Um, I am the host of this podcast. Today I am with J.P. Kühlwein. J.P. Kühlwein is one of the most prolific um, marketers. Uh, he's been a head having a career at Procter & Gamble over many, many decades um, um, in various parts of the world. He's been in Asia, in baby care, laundry, in Europe, in the US. He has led uh, various functions in operating management and strategic leadership, in managing premium brand strategies and innovation, new product development and global strategic planning. That's all a mouthful. <laughs> JP, like me, uh, shares an origin, Germany, <laughs> and so we connect from 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 us, uh, from those uh, um, uh, times. And I, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for joining us, JP Kühlwein. Erich, it's a pleasure. I guess it might have been. Um... Easier to the whole, to do the whole thing in German as well. <laughs> yeah, yes. Then it would have been twice as long, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and complicated. And complicated. But I think it's what what really sort of excites me to have you here is is because uh, you worked across many different categories. The major categories like like uh, detergent. Uh, you have been in the premiumization business, if you will, with premium brands in the beauty and healthcare business. And when I look at at, at the businesses, you've been in businesses that what I characterize as pipeline businesses, so the traditional G CPG, consumer product goods company business. And my question, and I hope we can explore this during the next uh, few minutes, is, is, you know, is this model, is, is, is the business of platforms a way to have rethink uh, uh, CPG? Is, in your opinion, what ails the pipeline or the traditional CPG business and might platform business models be a solution uh, out? Right. I, I guess I would say the short answer is probably yes. Um, the longer winded answer is, I mean, pipeline business, uh, uh, as you, you label it, uh, was a great gig. Um, and I was part of it uh, when it really uh, ran fantastically smoothly and you, know, you, you could measure it in the financial results. Um, as you said, I was part of, of P&G Laundry in the US. Then I actually moved to emerging markets, um, Southeast Asia in particular. Um, and we had fantastic results, S results that were built on building scale, an incredible moat, competitive moat by having, you know, a installed capital that was running incredibly efficiently, thus being able to offer decent to very good uh, to the best products at uh, competitive prices. And then, you know, cracking it in terms of how to talk about those pipeline products in a way that at first, you know, appeals to kind of the logic, um, talking about their um, functional benefits and then to the emotion. So it was a, a great product, particularly working on Pampers. It was amazing to see this brand moving from, you know, a couple of billion to 10 billion and more, basically a Fortune 500 company in and of itself. The challenge, as you said, has come over the last, I want to say, decade, maybe a little bit more. And I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how it came about. I think it's a combination of reasons, but I would say it's a combination of one, obviously, digital transformation and what that brought, which are elements of bringing transparency, bringing flexible supply chain opportunities, platforms, obviously, as we'll talk about. That combined with, I think, an economic, a, a, a deep economic crisis um, um, in, in the late part of the first decade 
that made consumers and people reflect about their spending, about what matters, about what they want to get out of products, the price they want to pay, compared with kind of a generational change as well and a change in thinking about transparency, about what they want their consumption to stand for, um, about fast fashion and other things. I think those are like three key factors um, that have led to the rise of these platform brands, digitally enabled, millennial staffed, um, and facing a consumer who is learning quickly to want more, want um, participation, if you like, in the consumption, personalization that comes out of it, unlimited choice in the long tail. And that was just something that the scale, the pipeline players that are so much based on scale and on running one machine at very high speeds and churning out as much product as possible have a very hard time competing with. Um, you know, this kind of flexibility of personalization uh, overnight delivery, get it whenever, wherever you want. Um, it's just very tough for the scale machine to respond to. So long-winded um, answer to yes, I, th I think, you know, um, platform is where it's going. And I think if these scale players can adapt to that, um, they, they can have a, a, a great, you know, resurgence. Yes. And, and it seems to me that, um, uh, in the platform business can be entirely um, complementary, it seems almost, to, uh, um, to the CPG uh, traditional uh, value chain and pipeline business. What I don't understand is, is why, if this is already a trend that has taken place 10 years now, as you said, sort of like, why does it take so long for that why do the CPG have to get first in trouble, if, if, if I may say, uh, yeah. until they uh, react to uh, new business models like the platform business? Well, um, Erich, you're the, you're the professor. I'm new to um, teaching. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if you, if you, let's say from a practical perspective, what I learned is it's incredibly tough for a scale-based traditional platform business to start to get used to give up what it considers its IP, its right to win, um, and, and uh, to start sharing. So specifically, you know, I'm, I mean, at, at Procter & Gamble, you know, we were, and, and Procter & Gamble still is, almost paranoid about kind of the secrets of how you scale your business, you know. Uh, whether it's in supply chain, how that works, whether it's in, you know, pricing and, and margin management with retailers, whether it's your, you know, secrets of how to build a brand equity and translate it to effective advertising or, you know, buying media. All of these are considered competitive advantages that are secrets. A platform is all about collaboration and sharing. Yes. Um, uh, it, it's about, in many cases, not even owning um, the capital and or uh, some of the IP expertise knowledge. Um, and, uh, whereas the, 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 the traditional pipeline business is all about, you know, at least owning kind of um, the, the key uh, uh, capital that is at the base of your scaling. So, mm -hmm. again, specifically on Pampers, you know, those machines running the diaper production literally would have parts uh, on it that, was that were called black boxes where the minimum amount of people would be able to even see how it works because it was considered and still is considered such a um, intellectual property and, and, and moat. So in that situation, opening up to start sharing knowledge, start moving out uh, uh, capital on both ends towards suppliers as well as towards uh, consumers is an incredibly tough thing to do. Now, I think, you know, during that last decade and longer, companies like P&G and, and, and other big CPG, FMCG players opened up in little pieces. So, for example, I remember uh, a program Connect and Develop by P&G R&D, which was all about collaborating with other researchers, 
material suppliers, etc. Um, and, you know, obviously on, let's say, the other end of the funnel, you know, on the marketing side, we always operated through agencies and, you know, a lot of uh, the brand uh, development happened there. So there were spots where collaboration happened and where increasingly there was pressure to open up in IT, the same thing, you know, let other people, you know, run platforms in IT, etc. But this whole idea of making it an entire organism, an ecosystem, is something that's about at least perceived abandon of control and mastering new skills, which are more about the algorithms and the the, the control the, the control of the nodes um, that are a totally different skill set and kind of scary, if that makes sense. Yes, it reminds me of of um, Apple. In fact, you know, Apple many yes. years ago was considered to be a wallet garden. Uh, Steve Jobs was about was very much about controlling everything. You can't, you know, we don't use your software on our um, Apple machines because your software are. We need to control everything, and and somehow. Uh, Steve Jobs in the development has got the religion in some ways and built the yes. app store and with the iPhone and became the most valuable company in the world now in some ways. It's it's sort of, if, you know, you describe almost uh, the CPG world in a way that the, the mindset that Apple had at one point in time, you know, very much controlling, very much um, being protective of the IP and and the knowledge and, and the operating procedures in some ways. Yeah, and, and uh, I've, I've, I've heard about this story quite a bit. And, you know, against the kind of myth that everything came intuitively and in a genius way to um, Steve Jobs, it seems that it was not at all intuitive to him and, and he had quite some difficulties at the beginning in, in getting used to the thought of opening up, um, um, particularly the App Store to developers. But that, of course, they then realized, fortunately for them, quite quickly was a genius stroke because it generated more and better and faster um, all these apps that made the big difference of uh, an, an, an iPhone um, that had this ecosystem um, and this flywheel of, you know, more demand, more, uh, more apps, uh, yes. more demand yeah. versus the old models, you know, the Blackberries or whatever in the same category that are still following or we're still following this pipeline um, structure of trying to control everything and own everything to a maximum. Yes, uh, and it it sort of um, it sort of Apple built a system, and this this is maybe pointing to what is CPG, where. Um, Apple not only benefits you and me using an iPhone, let's say, and uh, having always not something new to do on the iPhone, um, uh, but also it, it helps the developers, uh, the, the, the programmers, if you will, because uh, in the old days, before, before that, before the App Store, um, the, uh, the the developer needed a needed to do marketing. They needed to put a product in a shrimp shrink wrap package. They needed to sell to the retailer. They needed to to, to promote sales, sell their product to the retailers. They need so they so a lot of the in a way what it does is, is it helped it uh, it it eliminated some functions that developers didn't want to do in the first place, namely selling and marketing, and they could concentrate really on what they really do well, namely create great apps and and, and focus on coding and and and, and those those uh, and ideating new apps. So in a way, it is Apple becomes like this uh, a, a part of this ecosystem that matches in one side uh, consumers or users of mobile phones with app developers on the other side, and and it's almost like a value proposition to both. It's like benefit. Yep. It's yep. so so in the CPG world that that very same thing uh, should take place. Uh, in, in my question, the question I have first, however, is this: 
Uh, Steve Jobs is obviously very smart. He was able to change. He was only reluctantly to change, but he changed. Can CPG change, or is this, does that require a new generation of managers that, that are not looking at the same level of uh, the organization with, you say, uh, uh, controlling, uh, uh, protecting IP and so forth? Is that, does that, is that, can managers change? Um. Absolutely. I, I mean, it, it, it will change. Um, some of that change will be the decline or even disappearance of, of some companies, of course. But, you know, others um, will evolve. And, you know, let, let, let's remember, I mean, some of them have been around for 100 years or more. And obviously, that is proof that they've changed in the past. Uh, will they be able to do it again and in time in the future? You know, it's it's tough to predict. It's almost like the stock market. But we've had many changes in the CPG industry and uh, even at Procter and even in recent history. And it's a combination of, like you say, new people, new generation coming up, which is constantly happening, of course. And there's been quite some change to great new leaders at, at P&G recently. Um, and beauty, for example, in particular, which which had such a hard time, is, it seems to be doing great, and it's a big part of leadership, I think, as well. And and then you stumble over things sometimes out of desperation as well. You and I know well the um, old spice, then axe, then old spice again story. Mm -hmm. Some of the resurgence, for example, of old spice was, you know, almost like nothing to lose. We can try something radical. That was purely on a marketing communication and positioning basis, but it, it shows how, you know, sometimes desperation can force change that leads to fantastic business results and revives the business. And I think uh, a combination of all of this um, is possible and will happen in, in, in CPG as well. I, I want to come back to one aspect that you mentioned on Apple, which is this a great balance of achieving a win-win, what I would call yeah. it, um, you know, where the developers are happy, they can focus on what they're best at. Mm -hmm. um, Apple is obviously happy, they can focus on, you know, what they're best at, which is marketing, the total product bundle, mm -hmm. and there's enough money in, in uh, flowing into this platform to share, and, and there's a happy balance. That's something that is a flywheel, but also difficult to achieve. And and I've seen, you know, traditional pipeline companies starting to do that. Obviously, if you if you think of, for example, in the beauty industry, since I just talked about that, you know, app development there. Um, obviously, they've tried to emulate it. Sephora, L'Oreal, um, famously have developed apps, you know, to try on makeup, uh, you know, uh, kind of augmented reality uh, apps. Um, also ways to share this on social media, Instagram and so forth um, to then create product curation and bring in influencers. Um, some of these things have worked great. What is different though and is tough is the move all the way from just adding on some quote unquote gadgets or Apps. you know appendices of yeah. having a little bit of an infrastructure here and there as I just described to move all the way to a, a holistic ecosystem. And I think that is as much, if not more, about mindset than it is about uh, capital and so on. You know, um, it, It's really looking for every opportunity to make the total business stronger, faster, more agile, more uh, personalized, more transparent also from, a, from an equity point of view. And, and that is the really tough thing. So, you know, adding on little pieces, they do. But then I think there will be such increased complexity that that might either force the change and, 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 and the turnaround or, you know, force the decline, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's maybe, it's maybe the, 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 in this context, the whole idea of customer centricity or some call it now customer obsession, actually the wrong way to think about it you know it's like you know we we all singularly the idea of singularly focusing on consumers you know uh, 
maybe that's wrong. You know, maybe in the, in the platform world, is it's not just about consumers. It's about the win-win, the the balancing out of uh, the various parts of an ecosystem, if you will, or an interaction field, I like to call. It. Yeah, I, I never liked the expression consumer, even though it's a standard, and and I still find myself using it probably eighty percent of the time because it feels awkward to say people, but really. Um, talking about the client as the consumer puts such an emphasis already in the wor uh, uh, in the wording on they must in the end you know take my product and kind of destroy it right consume yeah. it so that I can make more of it so it's this whole force feeding kind of push marketing attitude that stands behind that word which I think is also a barrier to thinking more openly maybe about a balanced um, uh, infrastructure yeah. um, and, and not one that is all about one-way pipeline flows and actually that the product needs to be kind of fully consumed or destroyed at the end so that you can make new ones you yeah, know yeah so customer obsession consumer obsession is a is a is a term from the pipeline world in some ways um, now it, my question to you is this if, if L'Oreal is basically L'Oreal it's a very successful makeup genius app. It's called uh, 20 million users have downloaded it. Um, it's uh, if that is just a direction, do you have examples that that you would sort of like um, come to your mind that um, that actually take that a bit further than just uh, just a personalization or hyper personalization app like like a makeup genius, let's say from L'Oreal? What, what would that be? Right. So I, I've got two examples that are nice to kind of uh, oppose and, and contrast, but they're both into the platform and ecosystem world. One is a native platform and ecosystem and kind of a hero there, which is Airbnb, which I absolutely love and which I um, thought of when the two of us started talking platforms, I guess yeah. by now it's over a year ago. And another one, on the other end, more traditionally grounded or coming from um, um, pipeline, uh, not like Airbnb, kind of a digital and platform native, but on the other end, which you made me aware of, I dug into and, and I really start to admire, which are actually two, I should say. One is the South African insurance uh, company, um, health insurance company, or at least it started that way, which is Discovery with the Vitality program. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is Mars Pet Care. Um, and, um, uh, and as I dig into these two bookends, these two extremes, one is the platform native and the other one is the classic industry mm -hmm. that starts to transform into an ecosystem, I see how um, they can very much both uh, uh, um, become very successful and compete and how there's a future where these distinctions uh, no longer apply between, you know, all oh, your pipeline business and I'm a platform business, but really it's going to be all these mixtures. I mean, even Apple, yep. if we go back to our example, has elements of classic pipeline, which are their iPhones and, you know, the hardware that they sell and so on and, and some of the software they make themselves. And then, you know, tons of elements of platform, like, for example, the, the developer side. So I think that will be true for the future as well. Um, and, and, and what I like is that both the Airbnb example, as well as, let's say, the Vitality program in particular, show also the opportunity from not only the business opportunity in perspective, but also from strengthening the brand making the brand highly relevant and meaningful uh, to people. Um, the, the classic, what we would, would we have called the consumer, but also suppliers, etc. And I think that is another very interesting aspect for me as a marketer in that. Yes. Um, can you explain a bit more about this Vitality program? It, uh, just yeah. uh, for the listener, I think it... Uh, it's not probably not everyone is familiar with that. Right. So it, 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 it's fascinating. I mean, the idea is fairly simple, actually, but always it always takes genius, right, to start implementing something like this, which is, you know, um, the insurance business classically is about 
measuring the risk or you know of uh, insuring somebody against you know the likelihood of them living to a certain age or if you're in health insurance that's life insurance if you're health insurance you know like what the average cost will be over their lifespan um, you know looking at averages applying you know risk factors etc I mean they have a ton of mathematicians obviously in the insurance business what Vitality did was, well, it, it, it seems kind of passive and almost stupid to just accept mortality rates and healthcare costs to be a certain way. Can't we be in the business also of improving this for everyone, i.e. improving people's health, thus lowering their need for healthcare, for example, by doing more preventive, but also by being more fit, for example, thus lowering everyone's costs um, increasing some of our margins, but also being able to pass on some to the customer and to the suppliers. So kind of create a virtuous cycle that, by the way, which is nice from a branding perspective, nobody could really argue and fight and say it's a bad business thing to kind of try to make people live healthier and longer, thus lowering costs, but also, you know, squeezing costs out of the system and, and sharing the spoils of it. So. Um, basically what Vitality, which is the program name to the insurance, does is it rewards the insured for good healthy behavior, whether it's running in the park, signing up for a gym, going to preventive uh, medical checks, um, you know, taking their medication regularly, you, you name it. It, it. it gives you rewards and it, it lets you take part in taking better care of you by creating financial uh, incentives or things incentive like they give away Apple watches uh, you know so you can track your fitness or you know Adidas shoes which at the same time shows you where the platform comes in they have tons of um, other companies that collaborate with them like Apple or um, sports uh, apparel companies uh, medical uh, medical in companies hospitals gyms. and so on um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's really and and it works so well and it makes so much sense that I've seen. You know, they're now spreading or have already spread uh, to uh, uh, a ton of countries from originally South Africa <laughs> and actually selling this proprietary program to a ton of other companies like AXA or Generali or you know, mm -hmm. um, depending on the region, yeah. uh, John Hancock in the U.S., etc. So by, um, by, by, mm. by the interesting thing here is by your moving control, which with a normal health insurance company controls basically the premium that you have to pay, the doctors you have to go to, uh, uh, and, and basically is in the, in the controlling, if you be in the seat of control, you move that to the consumer. So I, as a consumer, am in charge of my health. I sort of like decide how much exercise I do and things like that, that reduce and that, and by, by, by handing the control over to the consumer in some ways, um, the whole system benefits. Uh, 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 I have lower in premiums or insurance rates. Uh, the health insurance company uh, makes a, a, a better cut. They need to pay out less to the hospitals because I need to go less to the hospitals. Um, and in a way, the, the health insurance company uh, uh, benefits because I'm longer around um, for many more years to pay the premium for them. So in, in some ways, everybody benefits. It's a win-win sort of of the entire system. We're taking a break for now, but we'll release part two of this conversation in a couple weeks. Make sure to tune back in and listen to Eric and JP as they share more examples of businesses embracing change in the CPG space. Thank you for joining us on the Business of Platforms.